On this episode of China Unscripted, China's commitment to zero COVID might crash their economy. Are there signs the U.S. and China are decoupling? And China's public opinion guidance goes very wrong. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang, and I'm Matt Ganesta. And as you can see, we are trying out our、uh, still in the works new studio. Wow, <laughs> it is very much in progress. Yeah, right before we started filming, the all of the power went out. Uh, uh, but hey, we're we're making it work. Happy twenty twenty two, everybody. Yeah, happy twenty new 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 year, new me, a new us. <laughs> well, kind of, since we're in this new studio. Yeah, that's right. That's right.、Yeah. It'll it'll be getting getting nicer sooner. So we got a lot to talk about today.、Uh, I know we have things planned out, but the first thing I want to bring up is so over over New Year's. Since we're basically kind of a family, we spent it together, and we watched the new Dune movie. Oh yeah, which is produced by a Chinese studio, right? Legends, legendary, legendary films. Yeah,、uh, is one of the executive, like one of the production companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is in- it's interesting because the, like, overall, I thought it was a fantastic、uh, adaptation of Dune. However, we know that since it you know had that Chinese production company, there were some changes made, obviously with China in mind. Yeah, like Do- well, Doctor Yue.、Uh, no, no spoilers for this several decades old book.、Um, <laughs> you mean because he was there was like a like an Asian character? Well,、Chinese、yeah, character. he he was he was well, Asian. I mean, he can... also spoke Mandarin. Oh right, he, he like did. Mandarin、yeah. was now like a thing there. Right, and then I the, forgot about that. that yeah, he spoke he spoke Mandarin too. So like yeah, yeah. Dune Dune is kind of like Lord of the Rings and where there's like all these different languages going on, but they added that、uh, you know Mandarin into this rendition of it. Is it supposed it. to be? Because I've never read Dune. Is it supposed to be like in the future of this world or like? Thousands and thousands and thousands of years in the future. So, like, but, but it's our our human race. It's like, our human it's, race, it's, it's but not, like Earth like is a dimension, like a, a different dimension or something. No, no, no.、It's, okay,、um, it's, so it's not like Star Wars. Well, no, Star, Star Wars Star is a long, long ago. Correct. <laughs> This is off topic, but do you know what I just found out about Star Wars that I didn't know, and it's totally blowing my mind?、Huh. What jazz is called in Star Wars? Do you know this? They they have jazz jazz music, like the like the the, the cantina the cantina like thing. That, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's called jizz. <laughs> oh,、um, all right.、Uh, moving and, on. And jazz play people will play d- that are called jizz whalers. <laughs> Lucas is—he's got quite a mind on him. I, let's, I let's, mean, let's call it jizz. I have no idea. I just saw it. Some... It'll be a little joke I'll play on everyone. We'll call them jizz whalers. <laughs> yeah. Can we get a little more Jar Jar? And they have、um, like specific—they named all the instruments that are played in that cantina scene. I don't know what they are. Oh gosh, that, But, that's that's the level. Like every probably every little instrument has like a name and like a giant Wikipedia page. <laughs> Uh yeah. Ah,、uh, so we were talking about. You're gonna、Dune. look this up afterwards,、yeah. aren't you? <laughs> Giant. The Chinese Communist Party is at war with the United States, and we are talking about.、Uh, well, not we, but, but Star Shel- Wars nerds Shel- are、Shelley、talking about Jizz Whalers. I yeah. just found out about this, and I thought I couldn't. I couldn't keep it to myself. Basically, that's, that's crazy. I thought you would know. Actually, <laughs> no. I feel like I'm over here trying to keep the podcast on topic, and I I've given up. <laughs> That's really early to give up. Yeah, <laughs> I know it's been <laughs> well, it's like been a long day、four. so far.、Yeah. Well, okay, okay, I'll I'll get us back on on、okay. on topic. So, so Dune. Yeah, yeah, Dune. It was interesting to see like how you know they added the、uh, Chinese character, the the that man, Mandarin is a language being used. And that that was basically all I noticed.、Um, I don't know if it's got it will be accepted into the Chinese market. I don't know if it was. I could look it up. Yeah. Oh well. But、uh, anyways, I think this is a perfect segue into another uh, fantastic uh, piece of cinema that has recently been released,、uh, which is Shin Hua's.、Uh, what's it called? Zero point zero seven. Oh, are we going to talk about that? We're going to talk about that. By the way, Dune was released in China in October. Wonderful. Wonderful. And、oh, it probably、on. made more money there than anywhere else. Because of、uh, theaters being open versus oh, that's right places, or I mean, theaters are open 
here now, but I don't know how many people are going to the movies. Yeah, in China, the government can just force people to go to the theaters. That's right. But they probably wouldn't for Dune. They might do it for like a the battle film. at battle at Lake Changjing. That's What's the one I was that? thinking. Yeah. Oh, the propaganda film. Mm-hmm. That uh, I think we've talked about it before. That is based on a. Uh, uh, Korean War battle between the U.S. and China at Lake. I think it's the Chosen Rev, the Chosen Reservoir. But it basically was a defeat of the U.S. military, correct? Or, yeah, I mean, well, it certainly portrayed that way in the Chinese propaganda film. Yeah, and it did. It did incredibly well. It right? is like the highest grossing um, movie, I think, in Chinese cinema history mm. etc and speaking of gross i really want to talk about this xinhua <laughs> propaganda thing so uh, so the background real quick is mi6 you know the the british intelligence agency uh the thing that james bond is you know kind of built around uh said they were going to focus said that china is their top focus or priority i think it was the word they used yeah richard moore the head of mi6 made a speech where he mentioned this so uh, wow uh Xinhua, state-run Xinhua, the mouthpiece of the Chinese Communist Party, put out a hilarious takedown of MI6, of the UK, and America. I think we should play, like, just a, just maybe, like, three or four minutes this? of this. No, 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 no. No, no. It's, no, no. it's, it's only just, four and a half minutes long. It's, it's the longest four and a half minutes of my life. It's, it feels like longer than Dune. It, it uh, does, actually. There is, like, after about... 10 seconds, I had to stop it. And then after 30 seconds, I had to stop it. And then after a minute, I was like, do I want to keep going? Yeah. Question your life decisions. Yeah. Okay, let, let's let's play like uh, 10, 10 seconds. It's, he, here you go. What a beautiful castle for a secret rendezvous, Agent 0 0.07. Why the American accent, Agent 0 0.06? I'm practicing for my new mission in America, by the way. Why do you own nothing, Pong? I mean, no house, no property, no stocks, shares, or bonds? Because a super spy always prefers to stay low-key. Ah. Now, what I find amazing, believe me, it gets much worse. Like, that was just a little clip. Uh, we watched the whole thing. But the or laugh almost track the made it seem much funnier, right? Yeah, well, you need to be told when to laugh by the state. There's something about that I'll talk about later, but go ahead. Okay. Um, but yeah, I just find it amazing that like, you know, if this is a production by Xinhua, this is like the Chinese Communist Party, the, 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 the second largest yeah. economy on earth, putting its whole resources into making this. I and mean, this is I the don't best think they could do. this was their whole resources. Well, it's not yeah, like but, Zhang Yimou came and directed the Xinhua. Sure, sure. But, but it's like if the U.S. government was like, all right, we got to make something. I mean, Xinhua so is literally the Xinhua news agency. It used to be called, Xinhua means like New China news agency. So um, it used to be called the Red China news agency back in the day, but no. now it's the New China news agency. And it is literally the mouthpiece of the Chinese government. So yeah, this would be like the US State Department or somebody just decided no. to release a, you know, satirical well, spoof. I, satirical I think, like I this mean, just goes to show that under oppressive communist regimes that don't allow free speech people aren't good at satire they're yeah. terrible at I mean, it american government films are much better produced like the moon landing <laughs> oh, Ooh, oh, that, oh, that's, pretty <laughs> that's pretty good that's pretty good i mean this actually makes me feel better about some of the like the like the skits we've done on the show on a, I'm sure a much, much lower budget. Yeah. But, it looks like they put a kind of a lot of money into sets. that. There was a Multiple castle looking building. Location. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Like even that guy's watch. I don't know if they, well, I don't know if we showed that clip. Of I'm it. thinking about like, like the stuff that we shot in Hong Kong in 2014. Oh, uh, um, oh yeah. The... <laughs> and it, like, we're trying to make it look high production, you know, when we had Alan or, our cameraman like doing all the what do you call it like Michael Bay shots and like uh, like you know moving the camera around making it look all yeah we did a better job uh, uh, so. there was yeah or I was thinking about the time we went to Hobbiton in New Zealand and like when, that was probably the silliest thing we've ever oh, done oh yeah where I dressed as, as yeah, Elrond where, where Chris dressed up as Elrond and then we went to Hobbiton and filmed check it check out that episode if you haven't seen it it's, I think it's called Two Hobbiton and Back Again I, th I think it's like our lowest performing it episode is, it was we ever terrible. made it was in the middle of like the first 
uh, you know, adpocalypse. And we were having trouble getting videos out because we were in Australia and New Zealand, couldn't get enough internet to, <laughs> to publish. So like it, it had like 20,000. It was really bad. It, it was but, bad. And also we filmed it on, like we secretly filmed it. Yeah. Remember? Oh yeah, they, they don't allow filming in there. Uh, I mean, well, I mean, they allowed like amateurs to like take photo and video. They just w wouldn't allow us to have like a film permit. Right. So, so, but we just kind of like took in our DSLR cameras and we're like, we're taking mm -hmm. photos right now. Actually, my favorite part though of that video was when the, <laughs> you're just outside of some of the, the like hobbit holes and then there was a busload of Chinese tourists and they decided they had to all come take pictures of you like you were an attraction at Hobbiton. I was so amused by it. It was, so, it was hilarious. Yeah. yeah, and there was the there was like the older like Chinese grandma saying, "Who's he supposed to be?" And his like the, the son grandson was like, was like uh, "Oh, he's, he's that guy from Game, Game of, of Thrones. Thrones." Yeah, it's yeah, great. I definitely heard that. Uh. <laughs> but so so back to uh, zero point zero seven. Great takedown. That's by the way. Uh, it's, it's 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 just a weird attempt at satire. Like you know they're trying to like criticize the US and the UK for considering China a threat and and making the point that oh you know they they're the ones that really are spying it's just really hard to follow though from from a logical perspective what they're talking about it's just like really confusing yeah and i can't decide whether it was supposed to be bad do you know what i mean like did they think that this was good it's, and then published it, or did they not care it was bad and published it because they thought that like it's going to get a lot of traction because everybody's going to make fun of it, but then they're still watching Chinese propaganda? It's it's really hard. Like I don't know if they have like those layers of. I mean, maybe satire. they thought this is awesome. It's it's like Communist Party officials. They think they're good, but they're actually bad. Hmm. Well, I mean, yeah. If if you want to subject yourself to the whole like four and a half minutes. Longest four and a half minutes of your life. Uh, you can check it out on Twitter. I don't know if we want to provide the link because then we're just we're we're helping, we're helping them. them. Yeah, this is the thing. This, it's like this is it's, this is it. Is this like some kind of four D chess where they know China Unscripted will make fun of them and then millions of people will watch it because millions of people watch us. Yes, you millions know. of people watch China Unscripted. Absolutely. Uh, well, you know the Richard Moore, the head of MI six. Re replied on Twitter to this spoof and thanked them for the free publicity. Oh, well, so, I guess spy agencies aren't good at satire. I mean, like, that's I, not, I just that's don't not a great know burn. Who was providing publicity for who at this point? Are they right? all in it together? Maybe. Oh my gosh. The governments of China, the UK, and the US all got together and <laughs> decided. Well, yeah, I don't it, think that was it. it, it they, obviously, the, the lizard people had a secret meeting in the okay, middle of the hall. Okay, can we put a? Can we? <laughs> we need a mute button for Matt's. Hey, that would be a good feature in the new studio. Yeah, mute. Write it down. Let it down. We were talking about the spray bottle, but I like the mute button. <laughs> the, the mute, mute button. button. Yeah. yeah. That's, um, actually, no, that's, that's, that's Anderson, fair. you could do that for us in post. <laughs> hey, yeah. Go back and mute him. <laughs> don't, don't do it, Anderson. Don't do it. <laughs> but, but, uh, you know. It's not like the U.S. doesn't do cringy videos. That have you guys seen that FBI videos about a few? This was a number of years ago. Yeah, there were there was some recent thing that they just came out with. Oh yeah, about yeah. Like, like an American like student taking money to provide yeah, this intelligence. Was, this one was that one was from back in like I don't know 2013, 2014, 2015. It was a long time ago. Th but, 2013 wasn't that long ago, Shelley. Okay, sure. It was like uh, three or four years ago. It was uh, three or four years ago when the FBI decade. made this video called Game of Pawns. Pawns, P-A-W-N-S. Okay, intelligence agencies are just not good at satire. No, no. And it was it was a... Uh, <laughs> Did they hire George Lucas? <laughs> I know. We'll no, call it, we'll actually, call it Game of but I Pawns. actually it's like did Game talk of to the screenwriter who wrote this um, movie for the FBI that was about. Um, was his name Borg Lekis? No. I'm, I'm, in, I'm imagining like George Lucas with a fake beard oh, on top okay. of his real beard. I was saying, hi, hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Borg Lekis. Uh, I, got, I got a movie called A Game of 
Game of Pawns. It was a, it was a 2013. It's the story of Glenn Duffy Shriver, who was this American college student who went to China to study and then basically got roped into like working for the Chinese like Ministry of you know something public Ministry of State Security. They tried to recruit him as a spy, but he was kind of incompetent. Like they wanted him to go back to America and try out for the, like take the test for the CIA, but he um, failed the, uh, uh, like the lie detector test. Mm -hmm. And the, the CIA and FBI knew that he was taking money from China and basically uh, arrested him. He ended up serving a few years in prison for it. And so they made uh, a video basically warning other Americans, because you all saw it, uh, basically telling them not to become Chinese spies. Yeah, they actually did take this um, like video and play it in universities and stuff. Really? Yeah. The they should FBI... have play, played it as like movie theater trailers. <laughs> it was a little longer than a movie theater trailer, but I see what you mean. That's actually something that the Chinese... Communist Party does. They play propaganda. Yeah. I wonder if they play that movies. at Harvard since there was that Harvard uh, professor who just <laughs> was convicted of hiding his connections to China. It was Charles Lieber. Uh, he was, he was secret. He, he was getting like paid like $50,000 a month to work uh, with like a. It's a not Wuhan. even clear if he was actually doing anything or if it was essentially like, a, like we'll put your name here. Because you have, yeah. you're a prestigious scientist and then you're going to be affiliated with our Chinese university now. And there's no, he wasn't convicted for spying or anything like that. Yeah, he, it was for hiding his uh, like financial connections to yeah. lying to the U.S. government about it. Yes. And at some point he must have realized that this was a bad idea that he had done this. And you know what I mean? Otherwise, why would he be lying about it if he was like, yeah, this is fine to... You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that is part of the challenge. Like, just a lot of people don't have any idea. Or maybe, maybe I do wonder what was going on in his mind. Did he, I mean, yeah, as you said, he must have known something was off if he felt he had to lie about it. Uh, well, I mean, maybe if the FBI is asking you about it, then you're suddenly like, oh, crap. Oh, I should lie to the I, FBI. Yeah, 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 this is <laughs> big brain. <laughs> huh? They'll never, never catch me there. Wow, these Harvard professors are smart. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it reminds me, I like, I really, I, I like what uh, Jim Cramer said uh, this week on Mad Money, where he was like, I can't recommend Chinese stocks because they're like a hostile communist regime. And like, he didn't I, actually say hostile. He didn't say hostile? That was in the Chiron, but he said uh, they were a communist regime, totalitarian dictator. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he went on to call Xi Jinping a terrorist dictator and... Uh, you know, said that he kill he's killing a lot of people and mentioned the concentration camps and essentially brainwashing. So I think, you know, hostile was probably implied. Yeah. Yeah. But it's great, great to hear that more people need to be talking about China like that. Yeah. I mean, Jim Cramer, this is a very fast about face because... Yeah, just a few months ago, right? Yeah. Back in the summer, he was talking about how you should buy uh, Didi, uh, the Chinese uh, like version of Uber was listing on the uh, Wall Street, basically. And he was like, buy DD stocks as soon as they go public, you know. And uh, that was July. And now he's like, okay, China is a communist regime and you should never buy anything uh, from them, et cetera. So, yeah, I wonder what happened. Well, DD crashed. DD crashed. But like, I, what, do you think that was... What was, I, I, mean, I doubt that was enough. Kramer also mentioned the geopolitical things that are happening, basically, where he was saying that, like, okay, a lot of these companies, Alibaba, um, Tencent, what if these companies might do well, but that doesn't mean their stocks are going to do well because of the geopolitical things that are going on between mm -hmm. the U.S. and China. And he mentioned a new Cold War, et cetera. Yeah. So it's great that that message is getting out there more and more. I think it was great that um, this past week there was the stories from the Washington Post and the New York Times about how how much data the Chinese Communist Party is harvesting about from Americans using their social media, using uh, Twitter or Facebook. Yeah, it was interesting. It was kind of like both the Washington Post and the New York Times were doing the same thing, which was looking at Chinese government procurement documents uh, where they were like 
like basically saying, we need this technology, we need the software, please come and bid for this. And then companies would submit their bids and this was all available um, on the internet, which I think is probably no longer available on the internet. But what they did was essentially look at all these documents and see that the Communist Party was spending hundreds of millions of dollars, I'm sorry, hundreds of thousands of dollars at a time, so millions total uh, on software to spy on people, not just in China, but also in the US and, and anybody using Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. Yeah, keeping, a, keeping track of like, you know, if somebody says something negative about China. Yeah, and uh, a lot of the software, it would automatically flag like there would like there would be like an alarm sent to the companies to alert them about like big negative trending stories about China or uh you know if it was really bad there was a 24/7 hotline that went directly to China's censorship bureau that the people working at these software companies were supposed to call it's they're so hard working they can have a 24/7 hotline like that and still put out great propaganda pieces like 0.07. That was a different bureau. That's <laughs> they're, they're so hardworking. Well, I think the interesting thing about the what the Washington Post and New York Times were talking about, and we did a video on China Uncensored about this topic. Uh, last, last, last week. We'll, we'll put a link we'll to that one below. That, That's, but like, it's an interesting episode. It is. It's called China is Tracking You Online. And it, it is because it is that it pretty much shows that China is tracking uh, everybody online. It's the actions of a hostile communist regime that is at war with the United States. But uh, what was interesting was the idea of public opinion guidance mm -hmm. um, that the Chinese Communist Party, they call the software public opinion analysis software, which sounds very innocuous, right, and boring. But actually what they want the software for is for what they call public opinion guidance, which is essentially using censorship and propaganda to change how people talk about things online or how people think of issues, right? And one of the things they were talking about is how China is now taking this public opinion guidance that they are already implementing inside China and uh, spreading it throughout the world. Even that terrible Xinhua propaganda thing is public opinion guidance. If, I don't know if that works really well, but one thing I found, um, somebody had posted this on Twitter, was, uh, do you guys know Code Pink? No. Uh, like, they're a women's, like, anti-war, pro-peace group, uh -huh. nonprofit. They were doing a lot of protests during the Iraq War. I think that's when they started. Okay. Uh, but someone posted uh, on Twitter that Code Pink um, ha is uh, hiring a... China is not our enemy campaign coordinator. Really? Yeah. So Code Pink um, is about to launch a campaign, apparently, about how China is not our enemy under the guise of, like, you know, anti-war stuff. Right? Uh -huh. So um, and then under the duties and responsibilities includes um, create campaigns for new communities to learn about China and engage, identify, solicit and acquire information about U.S. aggression toward China and track the lies and hate and develop responses. This but, is public opinion guidance. I wonder for how they're the going. Yeah, like, did they get infiltrated? Like, how are they going? Like, how are they going to talk about like genocide in Xinjiang or organ harvesting? I mean, that's all American imperialists. Like, this is Code Pink. I think is on the kind of tanky side of things when it comes oh, to China. Okay. Like, they're uh, they're you know, tankies are people who are left leaning but support authoritarian regimes that are. Uh, left-leaning, like China, Cuba. So you know, it's pink, but with a strong undercurrent of red. Okay, you could put it that way, sure. I did put it that yes. way, and but I don't have a mute button. It was just interesting to read this Code Pink LinkedIn job posting, right? Yeah. Right after reading this stuff about China's public opinion guidance, because essentially this is what China does, the Chinese Communist Party does, but it, this particular campaign is being run by a, mm -hmm. you know, U.S. nonprofit. Which China is very good at getting, like, you know, they understand the divides in U.S. society, and so they're good at, like, getting, like, these, you know, kind of fringe groups to help in their authoritarian propaganda. Yeah. 
And so uh, the, an interesting point we made in that episode about this public opinion guidance is that, uh, what, what was it, a couple months ago, Xi Jinping gave a speech where it's like China needs to present a, mm-hmm. you know, friendlier image to the world. And lovable, I lovable, think is how yeah. it's translated, yeah. Uh, he lovable Pooh Bear. Uh, but yeah, and so some people were like, oh, hey, you know, maybe they're going <laughs> to, you know, ease up a bit on, you know, everything. Uh, but then in, in the same speeches, it was, it was about essentially public opinion guidance, the idea that they're not going to present a more lovable image by changing. They're doing, uh, they're presenting a more lovable image by squashing anything, yeah. any opinion that uh, makes China seem unlovable. Amplifying the correct opinion, squashing the incorrect opinions. Yeah. I mean, he literally used the words international public opinion guidance. Mm-hmm. Like strengthen Applying international- it internationally. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Strengthen international public opinion This guidance. is one of those things where they say what they're doing and just some people just don't get it. Well, I mean, you have to admit that public opinion guidance is like a very disguised way to talk about what they're talking about. You know? Yeah, but I don't know. Public opinion guidance. It's like, it sounds creepy to me. Maybe I've just, I've read 1984 too much or just been watching the Chinese Communist Party for so long. I mean, we're in it. I don't know how creepy it sounds to people who aren't paying attention, you know? Yeah, but so like, how creepy pu- is it? Leave your comments <laughs> below. <laughs> On a scale of one to 10. Well, I mean, people who watch this are also a self-selecting group of you know of the millions of people who watch china unscripted yes they're very well informed about china is what i'm saying they are (laughs) i want to talk about china's zero covid policy but i think this is we'll do a small digression i think this is kind of related to some of the public opinion stuff is just elon musk the new the new tesla showroom in xinjiang like like you, you, you could have picked anywhere else. Like, yeah. why the genocide place? Yeah, it's 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 kind of staggering. Like, you know, especially as like Elon Musk, like he'll criticize, he'll do his like, uh, I'm 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 a cool super elite billionaire. I'll criticize the elite, but then yeah, Tesla showroom Xinjiang. There like, was something that the Tesla showroom in Xinjiang had posted on Weibo or something that I'm trying to look for it. There's a yeah. Look at this photo. Oh, gosh. All right. We'll put that up on screen. Yeah. Tesla loves Xinjiang. Yeah. Well, I mean, why not? It has such great uh, skilled labor because of all those vocational training schools that have taught the locals how to be such good workers. Yeah. So, I mean, some people have pointed out that Tesla is getting a lot of, like, bad publicity for this when there are a lot of companies that have, for example factories in Xinjiang, Mm -hmm. which might be worse. But, you know, I think it's one of those things where, like, if the NBA has a training center in Xinjiang, which they did for many years, if Tesla has a showroom, like, by pointing out the hypocrisy of these, like, larger companies, it you know, it it gets the attention of people, essentially. Right. Especially because there's this idea that Tesla is, like, one of the good guys, essentially. Because they were making electric cars? Yeah. Or because Elon Musk is cool and was on SNL? Uh, yeah, mainly the second thing, I guess. Little column A, little column B. But uh, yeah, like if this this car that you think is great and like going to change the world and make the world a better place, right? And this is what, of course, everyone in tech says, right? Trying to make the world a better place with their product. And in this case, electric cars. And then it's like, the place where they're putting ethnic minorities in concentration camps. Like it's so, a stark contrast. It is a stark contrast. Uh, yeah. but you know, also Elon Musk got in China, got in trouble in China two weeks ago for, you know, the Chinese government basically accused him of um, almost hitting the Chinese space station with his SpaceX satellites. That's right. Uh, so somebody on Twitter was pointing out that Elon Musk is very confused because he's both trying to hit the Chinese space station and take it down and opening showrooms in Xinjiang. Well, I I wonder if there's this pressure that Tesla is feeling to try to get on the Chinese Communist Party's good side. Oh, I'm sure. But like, there's no, look, Elon, if you're watching this, (laughs) there's no solution except pulling out of China. You are 
not going to get on the good side of the Chinese Communist Party. They're going to take advantage of you. They're currently ripping off your technology. They're currently ripping off your battery technology. You're losing that. Later, they're going to rip off your electric car technology. So please get out of China. That was, that, your was own sake. that was a really good point. I hope we uh, took him off mute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anderson, uh, dub him in if, in case he was on mute. Uh, but I do think that Elon Musk is naive about China in the sense that a lot of, you know, Western corporations are where they think that they can play both sides. And it worked for them for many years, right, that they could, you know, have um, – do business in China and do business in the U.S. And well, I think it, it worked out not as well as like it kind of seems on the surface. Because even during that, they were getting hacked. They were losing oh, yeah. their technology. Um, but not every company had that happen. Well, it was, it was less extent. reported yeah. than because these companies didn't want to, you know, their stocks to crash when it came out that they had been hacked. So this is something we know that a lot of places, just a lot of companies just didn't report. Yeah. Some experts have said that virtually every American company that's gone to China has been hacked or infiltrated to some degree. But they but, still thought it was worthwhile to keep being in China. Uh, yeah, but there's Most also- Most companies did not, have not pulled out. Yeah, but there's a kind of herd mentality. And, and we'll see it when there's a critical mass of companies pulling out, that other companies will suddenly become virtuous and pull out. But it's actually like, like people said, go into China. And there was this trend. And then, you know, everyone had FOMO. So they wanted to go in too. And everyone wants to get in China. And then no one wants to admit that they were actually wrong to have followed the herd and gone into China, even though they lose money. And then to a degree, the CEOs don't necessarily care because some of them are a bit unscrupulous and they know that, you know, they serve a CEO for five, 10 years and they get their golden parachute and they're out. So it's actually not even a huge deal if 10 years down the line, their product is ripped off. Now, I'm not saying all CEOs are like this, but there certainly would be some that are. So that, that, that just don't care enough. Uh, and then what we're going to see, though, like there will be some point at which I think corporate America recognizes how bad it is to be in China now. And they're going to, of course, blame it on the latest circumstances, not that they were wrong all along, even though you have been. Well, you are uh, kind of seeing this already, like what, what Jim Cramer said, uh, another uh, prominent Bond yeah, guy I mean, said is, China is, is uninvestable. This is just the beginning, and I'm not sure if this is like... But we're the beginning of the wave or just like a small blip in the the wave, like the wave might not come now. It might come um, if there's a an attack on Taiwan, for example, uh, it might come with some other uh, event or issue that that China caused. I mean, I thought I thought COVID would surely. That's a great wake yeah. people up. And you guys didn't wake up. And by you guys, I'm talking about these you know, billionaire CEOs mm -hmm. uh, who are obviously watching, watching our podcast. Well, I mean, I don't think it's here yet. For example, uh, what I was talking about was more that like in terms of U.S. China law, like companies could play both sides, right? They could do things in China and do things in the U.S. and they wouldn't get penalized mm. for it. But now things like the Uyghur Forced Labor Act, right, that was just signed into law last month, where now if you have products coming in from Xinjiang, you have to be able to guarantee to the U.S. government that they are not made with slave labor or else you can't import them. Yeah, which is a very high bar. Yeah. So a lot of companies are beginning to just pull out yeah. of Xinjiang because that's easier to do. Intel, for example, sent this note to all their suppliers, right, uh, warning them about using stuff made in Xinjiang because of this new law. And then basically the Chinese Communist Party started this propaganda campaign against Intel. Mm -hmm. uh, criticizing them for their stance on Xinjiang. And then Intel apologized, saying, that, oh, we didn't, it wasn't about what we think about what's happening in Xinjiang. It was just, you know. We uh, had to, the U.S. government well, forced Well, it was kind us. of like, no, this is just like, a, a, this is just about what's happening in the U.S. law. It's not, we're not making a judgment about it. But it, Intel's not at the point where they're like, okay, well, we're going to follow U.S. law uh, and we're going to pull out of China. They're trying to do both still. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty craven. Good on the U.S. government for passing this kind of bill because it, it forces these companies to be in a position where, you know, they can't please 
the Chinese Communist Party. They they are forced by U.S. law to do the right thing, and you know they, they can't really like. Well, what ultimately is going to happen is companies and countries will have to make a choice of either with China or without China, mm-hmm. and that'll that'll be that'll be a big turning point when that comes. It's interesting because some of China's policies may be forcing that to happen as well. Um, yeah, they want it as well from like a different. Yeah, I mean they have been. They are decoupling from the Chinese Communist Party is decoupling from the U.S. financially uh, for a number of reasons, but they're trying to do it while not spooking Wall Street into. Uh, saying don't invest in China. Right. I mean, they want to do it on their terms, on their timeline. So yeah. like you, you have to, to decouple, like basically for, from America's perspective to decouple, basically we would have to, we'd basically uh, make it illegal for U.S. listed companies or U.S. private companies to be involved in China in various ways. You know, you know take China out of the banking system, all right? Take China out of the, you know, uh, Swift. The, well, Swift is part of that, right? Money transfer, uh, and basically uh, ban uh, imported products where the where China is a country of origin, right? Chinese companies can list on U.S. stock exchanges, yeah. right? There's and there's there's a few, you know, there's a, a small handful of of key things with 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 well written laws that could do that, mm. and that obviously that's a a pretty hardball approach to decoupling. That's what America would do, right? But China wants to eventually decouple from the US, but on very different terms, right? Like China wants to be out of the US banking system, but not the same way, not like by being kicked out. They want to be out by, like once the the renminbi is a uh, currency that's used, well, it's, it's kind of used as a reserve currency, uh, but not once know, it only, replaces only by, the only US by the dollar. IMF, and that's more of a technicality. But like, you know, once countries trade in RMB, once a large number of countries have based their own digital currency on uh, the RMB digital currency, for example, once the you know diff- enough parts of the international banking system are using RMB for trade and not converting to dollars first, which by the way is what most most international currency trade goes from like one local currency to US dollars, then back to like another currency for trade, like say between two countries in Africa or something. Um, But like China wants its currency to be part of that and they need to control the banking system. And once they do that, they're going to have the power to decouple financially. Once China has stolen a sufficient amount of technology, uh, stolen a sufficient amount of, what do you call it? Like manufacturing know-how, which is not just the technology, but also the the skilled labor and uh, managers and equipment uh, that they've developed in-house, right? Or when they control the shipping lanes of the South China Sea. Right. So like, exactly. And so like, they want to be in a position where they have all these things and then they can decouple. Yeah. Or they might do it a little bit gradually, but essentially- I mean, I think they're already doing it, but gradually. For example, they started pressuring Chinese companies to delist from Wall Street. Uh, from the New York Stock Exchange uh, and relist in Hong Kong or Shanghai, places that they can control better. Because, you know, for many years, Chinese companies were listing on Wall Street as a way to get an uh, infusion of cash, right, and dollars. But now they want to control, the the Chinese government wants to control these companies like Didi, uh, Tencent, these right. big tech companies. I mean, like if, if, a, if a company like Didi is listed on the New York Stock Exchange, then they are to some degree required to comply with certain U.S. laws and regulations. Actually, that's not been great because, I mean, this is a problem. During the Trump administration, the SEC was essentially saying that they were going to delist some Chinese companies for not uh, complying to auditing requirements. But this the auditing requirements thing has been a problem for like a decade or more. Right, because basically while U.S. companies like have to have certain levels of transparency, the same data, the same documents in a Chinese company are considered state secrets by the Chinese- For private government. companies. Right, a, a totally private company like like Huawei or Didi or Alibaba, 
right? Their internal corporate documents are considered state secrets, and therefore the SEC essentially gave them a pass for auditing. In other words, the SEC didn't require the submission of certain documents that would have proved their financial viability. And this, what was that um, like Starbucks competitor that had this big problem where they'd faked a bunch of data? Oh, Luck and Coffee? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, Luckin collapsed, basically. Right. But like... It, it had been listed it on the been, U.S. Stock Exchange so. and it, it lost a lot of people a lot of money. Right. Um, it lost a lot of Americans a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, but so the Chinese government, though, is now decoupling a lot of Chinese companies from the New York Stock Exchange. So that's they're starting. Right. Right. But as they were doing this... Ah, Bloomberg, I think, reported that they had a secret meeting. The Chinese government called in like the heads of like J.P. Morgan and Goldman and like all of these big investment banks, BlackRock, in their Chinese um, like their Chinese subsidiary firms, and brought them in and reassured them that you know everything's fine. We're not decoupling. Uh, basically, trying to keep these. Uh, investment firms on board to putting more money in China as they were moving their companies out of the U.S. And they'll throw a bone to like investors, like uh, changing the rules, like allowing foreign companies to now have majority shares yeah, in China. I think J.P. Morgan has opened a mutual fund. Um, BlackRock has opened a mutual fund in China and they were allowed to operate them without having to have like a Chinese company as a partner. Which yeah, they previously they, had to yeah. do. But wouldn't they under Chinese law still have to have a Communist Party branch in their Chinese subsidiary? Yes. And I think also like their, the money has to stay in China. So, so it well, seems like a sort of liberalization, but it's really not. It's, it's, a, it's part of this greater plan to decouple from the US. Yeah, and I think also what the Chinese government is doing with these JP Morgan and things like that, it's it's more that they're also trying to steal their mutual fund technology in a certain way, like their know-how for how to set up these financial investment vehicles because, you know, in China the there's really no place to invest your money other than real estate. Uh, or putting it in a bank, but that does nothing. And so there's not really the infrastructure of like mutual funds, like all these different places to put. Well, there aren't the reliable ones. Like you have a lot of these loan companies. Like, that, like the, sh the that, shadow banking stuff. Yeah. And they pop up and they, and they have like, you I mean, know, they're loan Ponzi's, packaging. And they're, they're Ponzi schemes, A lot of them are. Yeah. So the Chinese Communist Party realizes that this is a problem because yes, what is. happens, people get really upset. Like, look at what happened with Evergrande, right? People got really upset because they had been buying Evergrande, not just the real estate, but also Evergrande had been doing some kind of like money loan kind of products. Right. And then they defaulted on them and people were going and demanding their money back they, and it caused uh, like protests. They should learn from the U.S. banking system, which never crashes. Well, okay, that aside, what they're trying to do is say, J.P. Morgan, BlackRock, come in, we'll learn how you yeah. operate these things. And then we'll have Chinese companies that do this, and then you're, get, you're gonna get kicked out. Right. In fairness, the American banking system is less unstable than China's, not the banking system, the investments, um, the suite of available investment products to Americans is less unstable than its counterpart in China, right? I feel like my hand is hovering over the mute button in case you start to talk about the Fed, <laughs> and then I need to protect our lives. Okay, let's move on from this topic. But yeah. my point was that essentially what's happening to JP Morgan and all these companies is that they're in the, they're in the honeymoon phase mm -hmm. of going into China and, you know, they're about to get their technology stuff. And they find that the honeymoon is just a honey, honey pot. Trap. Oh. Close. What's the right term? Uh, I think it is a honey trap. A honey trap. Well, I mean, you know, you have the pot of honey mm -hmm. with that's the a, lid that trend. closes. So that's... That's the trap. It's the same thing. It's yeah. the same thing. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Um, so speaking of COVID... <laughs> <laughs> good transition, huh? <laughs> well... In a way, COVID is forcing China to decouple from the rest of the world. That's that's true. Um, 
Goldman Sachs uh, just like said that they don't think China is going to open at all for 2022. So, and a lot of this is because of their their zero COVID policy. So yeah, this does tie into the financial thing. So it was a great segue. Agreed, Chris. Go ahead. We, we are unanimous. We are unanimous. Um, Shelly said nothing, but yes, we're unanimous. Well, she didn't need to. I have guided her public opinion. <laughs> Uh, Good callback. Hey, thank you. Thank you. I'm great at this. So, yeah, we're really seeing China's zero COVID policy, like, really fraying at the seams. You know, China has obviously lied about the coronavirus from day one. Uh, you know, their numbers have been total Only lie. four people have died in China since April of 2020. Did you know that? Well, it's because they were so good at lockdowns. If only the rest of the world would have more lockdowns. By the way, that's the, according to the official death toll, which is not correct. But just to clarify, oh. not, it is not true that only four people have died. It's impossible. It's four people have, only four people have officially died. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, no, it's just that the, the mortality rate from COVID in China is extremely low, right? Oh, no. I, it's, it's, it's instead of, you know, say 2%, it's only 0.00001%. No, that's not it. It's because they haven't had any cases, Matt. I thought Xi'an locked down because they had 1,700 cases. I mean, besides Xi'an. That was their that was their. How do you have 1,700 cases and no deaths? I mean, because their well, because vaccines the mortality are rate really is effective. extremely low. But if the vaccine is very effective, then why are they locking down? So they have claimed to have vaccinated 1.2 billion people in China. Okay, which which is which is shocking because there was somebody who worked on like was it the AstraZeneca vaccine who was basically talking about the how difficult it is to vaccinate, how difficult it will be to roll out booster shots globally mm -hmm. because most of the world hasn't even had their first well, yeah. shot. So the idea that one point two billion people in China, like way out in the sticks and all the rural p places like that. Everyone has gotten their shots. I mean, I actually think that that's one of the more believable statistics because COVID they can just force people because they can just make people get shots. Right. Uh, or they can um, line people up in cities to get tested or whatever. I think that's like actually more believable than okay. four thousand three hundred people have died. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there there are a lot, a lot of qualifications for their zero COVID policy. Like now they've it's, basically staked their political reputation on this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, they have handled it better than anyone else in the world. They particularly criticize how poorly the U.S. handled it. Um, so everything is about how they have handled COVID better than anyone, even though, you know, the U.S. government unleashed covid into china they still manage <laughs> through fort dietrich and the <laughs> fort dietrich and frozen foods yeah and, and you criticized me for joking about the moon landing i don't believe i did oh i, I think we were saying that we were going to put a mute button but i think that was after you started talking about lizard people yes <laughs> i'm we're not saying that the chinese conspiracy theory is good <laughs> It's about as good as 0 0.07. <laughs> but um, uh, so they now have to kind of stick to the zero COVID thing, right? Yeah. But they're kind of, they're qualifying it by, because there's no way that they can keep up zero COVID. What are they calling it now? The, the dynamic zero COVID they policy? They started calling it a, a dynamic zero COVID. And the latest thing is that Xi'an last week claimed that after 14 days of lockdown, they have reached zero COVID on a societal level. Mm -hmm. Which means that there is no community spread. That This is what they're claiming. They're like, there's no societal spread of COVID. So there's still spread, there's still cases, like for example, if somebody gets COVID in a family and every, other people get COVID, that doesn't count anymore towards zero COVID. Because they've been so locked down, that family unit can't spread it to any other family. Yeah, so, so it's- Especially when they can't go out and go get groceries and right. start to starve. But like that is how you reach societal uh, zero COVID okay. by containing the spread 
among society. That's the That's some great new thing there. Yeah. It wasn't wasn't there also something about how they were just taking people out of the city who yes. had COVID? So they've set up a bunch of quarantine camps in the suburbs uh of Xi'an. So that might also be something that they're doing where it's like a statistical trick, right? Where you're like, okay, well, <laughs> these people with COVID are no longer in they're Xi'an. They're not in Xi'an. So there are no COVID cases in Xi'an anymore. Neat little package. Uh, but apparently they're not just moving people with COVID to these quarantine camps. It's like if somebody gets COVID in the resi- like an apartment building, the person, their family, the entire apartment building gets moved. This is sounding um, like North Korean detention work camps. It is very, you know... North Korean in that way, right? Uh, We've talked about how China is just North Korea with better PR. Yeah. Uh, but it is the 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 top-down control that lets you essentially like force everybody in an apartment building to go into a government quarantine. Um, but yeah, so it's clearly a lot of cost to this type of zero COVID policy, right? And mm-hmm. we're seeing it in Xi'an because the outbreak there has been bigger so they've locked down has been harder and they're still locked down even though they claim that they reached societal zero covid nobody's still allowed to go anywhere yeah and china's like one of the last places on earth that's still like even saying they're going to attempt this zero covid thing yeah they're not just saying that they're defending it still but yeah uh, because they can't admit that it's wrong and uh what i wonder what's going to happen is what's going to happen to the chinese economy because xian is a city that doesn't have whole lot of industry, but it has, for example, um, there are some high-tech things like the Micron and Samsung, they both have microchip factories in Xi'an. And they were saying that the lockdown is basically really affecting their ability to uh, produce microchips that are already in short supply, right? Well, I mean, slight digression, that's one of the reasons why the Chinese Communist Party wants to invade Taiwan is so they can take over the Taiwanese semiconductor industry. Yeah. In fact, I, I think the Taiwanese uh, military came out with a paper saying that like, if China does invade, they need to destroy their own semiconductor factories. Just total war kind of scenario. Yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised, yeah. actually. Yeah. But, that uh, would be bad if they got that technology. No, it would definitely be. And I think that's one of the major things that they're trying for, right? Xi Jinping has said in the latest five-year plan, economic plan, that like what they need to do is develop their semiconductor industry. Um, but anyway, what I was going to say is there are now there's now an outbreak in Shenzhen. Mm. And there are reports that people are being told they cannot leave Shenzhen without a negative test, mm. which sounds like the beginning of a lockdown. Now, Shenzhen is like a huge manufacturing hub in China. Imagine Shenzhen getting locked down the way Xi'an's getting locked down. That would be devastating. Yes, devastating, especially to China's economy, which is already not doing well. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's affecting all the global supply chains. So this is one reason I'm saying that China's zero COVID policy may further the decoupling of China from the rest of the world. It's also going to get increasingly difficult because the data seems to show that Omicron, the Omicron variant is spreading faster than Delta, which was already spreading faster than the Alpha variant, right? There's no reason to believe that we're not going to see yet another variant that is perhaps uh, even more highly contagious, hopefully less deadly, but more highly contagious than Omicron comes sometime in 2022, right? And so it's already almost impossible to contain Omicron. I mean, if you look at the, the data in the U.S., which is at least reasonably reliable, despite obviously problems with, with testing and so on, but like clearly we're seeing a huge spike in Omicron because just it's so contagious. Yeah. So so this zero COVID policy is essentially, I think with Omicron it's impossible to maintain, but with the next variant it'll be, uh, it'll be impossible if it's not currently. I think I have heard that they've already found a Sigma variant. I could be wrong about that. That might that might have come either from a meme <laughs> or a dream I had. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta stop. Uh, like, you cut down your time on the internet if you're dreaming about. Yeah. Hey, those are the, I, those are the most reliable sources of news. I, I dream about scrolling through Facebook. <laughs> uh, well, transcendental I mean, visions in meditation are also a very very reliable news source. Okay, well, that's a different. Um, 
I have to start a different channel for that. <laughs> Meditation's I already, unending. Uh, yeah, I already have started it. it uh, I transmit it directly to people's pineal bodies. Those who are receptive can see it. I see. Leave your comments below if you like that show. I mean, I, I'm assuming you have the wisdom to be able to pick up my signals. I assume you have. Their chakras are open. They're, yeah, all oh, those chakras. Okay. I, I install extra <laughs> chakras. <laughs> Chock full of chakras. That's what I call it. You know, I used to have a little bit of a speech impediment where I couldn't say ch sounds. So uh -huh. chock full of chakras. It's like still, it's a, it's, I'm pleased that I can say that. Once upon a time, I could not. Wow. Isn't it chakras? Am I? Chakras. Chakras. Okay. Ch <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, no. <laughs> it's falling apart. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, sells, Hong Kong. Sells, okay. So. I, to your point about Omicron. I wanted you to just talk can gloss about... over my point about trans. Go yeah, yes. yeah, I am. Okay, I am doing that right now. Uh, so about how Omicron is going to make zero COVID impossible, I don't think that they found Omicron in Xi'an. Uh, I'm not clear clear about that, but Omicron has been found in Hong Kong. Hong Kong also has a zero COVID policy because of China's zero COVID policy, mm -hmm. and their zero COVID policy is just falling apart because of Omicron. Like. Hong Kong, you need a three-week quarantine. Wow. They they started implementing a three-week quarantine in 2020, even though people were like, that's a little overkill. Like scientists and doctors were like, that's too much. But they've kept it in. So um, you have to be in a hotel room for three weeks. But in, from some countries, you have to go to a government quarantine center for a week first mm -hmm. in Hong Kong. And then you go back to your hotel for two more weeks of quarantine. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is how uh, severe Hong Kong's like zero COVID policy is. Like everybody has to, uh, you know, register for contact tracing. Like so, Hong Kong was like, okay, there was a ProPublica article recently about this Hong Kong American woman who went home to visit her parents, and then was like, I had to be in quarantine for three weeks, and it was like not fun. But then when I got out, I felt safe because. You know, everybody was wearing masks still, but there was no community spread of COVID. This mm -hmm. was, she went in December. That's so. funny, because I, I just read an article today in Hong Kong Free Press that says uh, uh, there, there's now a quarantine for 170 guests at a Chinese official's birthday party. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. It's, oh, I stole your thunder. <laughs> no, it's just that I was still making the previous point. But No, but I wanted to interrupt you to make the same point that you were going to make, which is my prerogative. Everyone who's been tuned in to Meditations on Ending, uh, I already predicted that. And they knew it. We're doing really well, guys. I, I gotta be well. honest. As I started talking, I saw the look on your face, which was saying that I was interrupting you to make a point that you were going to make. And I knew that. <laughs> and yet, I still felt I had to continue <laughs> to make my point. Well, I mean, at that point, you're all in, right? I know. Oh. It's too hard to back. Conversations aren't about listening to the other person. It's about enforcing your the will on top of that. <laughs> oh, no, I lost this conversation. <laughs> you just got to wait for the openings. So you could, you're just waiting until you can say the thing. And then Blitzkrieg. Just, yes. Yeah. Uh, but my point was that like people felt like, well, oh. thanks for watching China Unscripted. <laughs> uh, Go I'm going to start a channel called Shelly Uninterrupted. <laughs> the, that won't have us on no, it then. <laughs> that's the only. Okay. So my point was that Hong Kong was like, oh yeah, zero COVID. We're like, our quarantine is the strictest in the world, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, it was cutting them off from the business and financial industry that was basically Hong Kong's lifeblood, but they were like, this is worth it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and now Omicron is basically, like you were talking about, 170 guests at this Chinese official's birthday party in Hong Kong. They all have to go to the quarantine center in Penny Bay because two of them tested positive for COVID. Um, and a lot of the people were uh, very pro-Beijing politicians. Like, remember Junius Ho? He was one of the kind of guys in uh, during the protests who was anyway people hate him okay like i hated hong kong and i hate him too 
a pro Beijing Hong Kong official. He's one of the people that was at this birthday party. Mm -hmm. I'll have to go to quarantine for three weeks. Nice. Well, this is interesting. Like, uh, I was talking on an episode about how the Chinese Communist Party, one of the part of their ideology is, you know, struggle and they have to struggle against heaven, earth and man. And this it's interesting to see how this ideology has affected the zero covid policy that they think they can just strong arm a the natural a virus, which is stupid. Very stupid. But it's interesting to see how like this this adherence to this this worldview could actually cause irreparable damage to the Communist Party's rule. Like the, the economy tanks because they keep saying we have to have a zero COVID policy. I mean, Hong Kong, they just restricted um, people from being able to eat after 6 p.m. Like, Be, what? Like, like restaurants, nobody's allowed to be open past okay. 6 p.m. It's true. Omicron at night. Yes. it's The funny it's thing wild. is they did that because there was Omicron transmission during a lunch hour, like people got it at a restaurant, but it was during lunch. lunch. So they're f shutting down after 6 p.m. Uh -huh. But, but it, that doesn't stop the lunch. Right. Uh, they tried to do that before in the beginning of the pandemic and there was too much public opposition. So now everyone's like going to eat dinner at 5 p.m. Like that's not a thing people do in Hong Kong. Well, have to I mean, that's for themselves. <laughs> Or right, you have to like not eat at restaurants, right? But like they also have completely stopped flights in from a lot of countries. Hmm. You cannot get a flight from the UK to Hong Kong or the US to Hong Kong. Well, that's very convenient considering Kong. all the other repression that's going on. Yeah, that, they that's don't want true. they don't want people to see that. I mean, but you know, I think Air Canada ended up canceling their flights for three months. Wow. into Hong Kong because they were like, we're restricting flights for several weeks or a month. And they were like, we just can't keep this up. Canceled all their flights. Yeah. I mean, to your point, Chris, about it makes it harder for like foreigners to see what's going on. I mean, the good news is though, already in Hong Kong, there's so many independent media that are able <laughs> to report on what's going on. You know, Carrie Lam just mentioned this week how, how much press freedom they have in Hong Kong. I mean, everyone still needs to follow the law. Right. And it, it does, you know, come in the wake of three independent media shutting down, like within the span of a week. Well, because they didn't follow the law. Yeah. No, no. Only one of them shut down because of that. The other two shut down because they were scared that they were going to get in trouble next, essentially. Mm. Well, Apple Daily and Stan, they got shut down. There was also Citizen News and something, which I, I th this is my favorite title, Mad Dog Daily. Mad Dog Daily. They also closed themselves down. Mad Dog. That makes me think of the Bell Brothers. That's not a reference you two will get. No, actually. Yeah. I used to have a, uh, like a surfing shirt that said Mad Dog on it. I thought no, it I remember those. Hurt. Yeah. They were disgusting. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> it's, it's like a uh, California surfer kind of thing, right? Okay. I'm not from California. Dude. Oh, rad. <clears throat> Sorry. Where's that, where how, that mute how button? Do, how do we recover from this? We don't. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. That's, been... that's it. I've, I've wrecked the podcast. Um, uh, anyway, so independent media shutting down. Uh, COVID is wrecking Hong Kong's economy. Uh, we can Well, never China's go economy. Kong. Yeah. So, everywhere. Well, it's, it's not COVID that's doing it, really. It's more like the government response to COVID. I mean, if we're going to be precise. Yes. yes the... That's true. And I wonder if what's happening in Xi'an now is going to make people realize that they should not lock down again for Omicron? Yeah. Well, I don't know, because I think I think there are politicians in the West who just like this degree of control or who are also in a situation where they feel like they they have to try and like put on a show of trying to restrict it because otherwise they will seem like they don't know what they're doing. It's, it's the same mentality as the Western companies that go into China. They see themselves failing, but they don't want to admit it. So they stay in China, even though they're losing. Oh, wow. We're in a pretty it's, deep hole. I know. Let's dig ourselves out. I mean, it's essentially that's what's happening, right? Yeah. In any country that has zero COVID policy, they either have to admit that they were wrong uh, or they have to find some other political way to back out of it. Or, because there's no there's no solution. I think to such everybody else fires. has already backed out. Yeah, it's not even the for, zero policy, yeah. zero COVID policy. It's just like it's like how the scientific community before the pandemic 
was a, the mainstream scientific viewpoint was that lockdowns and quarantines don't work, don't do them. And then because of China, largely and some bad science from the, what was Imperial College of London, uh, people bought into that, oh, we have to do lockdowns and we have to do quarantines. And now we're seeing that that does, isn't really going to work with something like Omicron and whatever might come next. And then you have, you know, politicians having to be in a situation where they have to do the thing they hate the most admit they may have been wrong. I'm actually, I feel like in in certain places, like in the U.S., a lot of places are saying we're not going to go back to lockdown. Well, that is the thing. That's the weird thing about COVID in the U.S. It's like, you know, in New York City, people are asking, oh, when are we going to go back to normal? And in parts of the country, they'll be like, we've been back to normal for a year and a half. Oh, but even in New York State, right? Uh, our governor said, we're not going to go back to lockdowns. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Um, and it's very different in like New York City in the five boroughs versus like some other part of the state, right? True. Yeah. But I think even New York City, they're not saying they're going to go back to lockdowns. Yeah. Yeah. So, but anyway, I mean, you you at least have a variety of responses across the U.S. And to some degree, there's a there's a value in this, which is that we as a society, media, politicians can observe which of the state policies kind of work better and which don't, and in theory can adopt the ones that work better. Now it's more complicated than that because uh, there's politics involved, right? But from a from a purely a scientific and, and uh, observational standpoint, it's good to have a variety of responses, right? Yeah. It's hard because a lot of people are afraid, and this is just when we need to tell ourselves, I must not fear. Fear is the mind, mind killer. killer from that hit Chinese movie Dune. And I think, that I think that's well a done. nice little yeah. bow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks I for. I didn't think we were going to recover, but you did it. <laughs> yeah, I'm good at what I do. <laughs> Thank you for watching China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And I'll see the special people on uh, Meditations on. Interrupt. What, what? What was it? Damn it. Unending. Unending. I al it was al almost. <laughs> it was almost. Unending perfect. like this podcast. Good Meditations night. uninterrupted. I don't think that exists. No, it's Shelly uninterrupted. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good night. Goodbye. <laughs> Go away. <laughs>